And now, a message from the Chaparral Heads of Tourism. Chaparral, for only $6.99.95, you can travel to the five different Chaparral. First, it's located in, throughout California. Brandon, didn't you see someone famous from there? Yeah, I saw Brad Pitt in a coffee shop. That's amazing, he's a great looking guy. Yeah. Also, on the coast of Chile, Australia, Mediterranean Sea, and finally the coast of Cape Town, where there's beautiful shrubland, and that's where me and Oscar Pistorius go on our midnight hikes. The Chaparral biome is known for its hot and dry climate and its beautiful valleys and mountains, which are perfect for taking a girl on a hike, especially if you want to go see a nice sunset. Also, in the Chaparral biome, there's a lot of biodiversity. There's coyotes, cute little bunnies, and bobcats, which just scare me. And now Discovery Channel has a nice treat for you. I'm Bear Grylls. I'm going to show you what it takes to get out alive to some of the most dangerous places on Earth. In the Chaparral biome of California. The most extensive eco-region in the state. It covers a twentieth of it. It's incredibly dry here. And in the summer, as we are here, temperatures reach above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's incredibly incredibly exhausting. My waters, my resources are depleted. And I need to stay cool. So instead of taking off my vest and my incredibly warm sweater, I'm going to put my wrists on the ground in an attempt to cool the rest of my body. Just like so. The chaparral biome is characterized by a Mediterranean climate consisting of moist, mild winters and hot, dry summers. It is important to note that moist does not mean wet, as chaparrales only receive 10 to 17 inches of rain per year. Chaparral exists 30 to 50 degrees north and 30 to 40 degrees south latitude. They are the recipients of westerly winds. Chaparral contains scrublands, and these unique thickets grow at various densities based on their elevation and soil type. Scrubland is particularly susceptible to fires and fire plays a monumental role in chaparral development. Many flora and fauna have adapted to this factor. Soil in the chaparral biome is very nutrient poor and shallow. This gravelly terrain is often the victim of erosion and soil becomes so dry that iron oxides form instead of clay and the red-brown result contains little humus. Organic matter burns with each fire and the infertile soil lies over a fractured bedrock. Chamise is an example of a shrub that grows densely in order to prevent erosion and cover the nutrient poor soil. Serpentine soil exists in California. In the Mediterranean basin, terra rossa or red earth is widespread in these scrublands. In this image, one can see extreme limestone fragmentation. All right, here you can see the low shrubland of the chaparral. Shh, shh. You see that? That is a coyote. One of the chief predators of the chaparral with dangerous teeth and extremely fast speed. All right, I'm gonna use this tennis ball that I filled with grasses and assorted pebbles to impale my dinner, all right? Crouching away, crouching away. All right, stay low. Stay very low. Let's go, let's go. All right, now that I've caught my prey, I want a bit of small fire using various shrubs in this dry climate. And I'm going to eat. There are many animals that live in this biome. There's the black-tailed jackrabbit. With its large ears, it changes blood flow to regulate body heat. It lives in areas where it can see predators coming and they can run up to 36 miles per hour to escape them. Its diet consists of grasses, leaves, and twigs. And the jackrabbit is located as a secondary consumer on the trophic pyramid. 
The cactus wren bird likes to live in a chaparral that has recently been burned. They don't like to migrate and they eat insects like ants. Currently they are dying off in California because of human development and urbanization. It is a primary consumer. Puma is a very adaptable animal. It eats deer, insects, birds, and mice. It will pretty much eat any small or medium sized animal and it hides its food under the leaves to save for days. It is an apex predator. This biome has many different plants. The leaves in this biome are characterized as evergreen. They are small, thick, and stiff to deal with high density vegetation. Evergreen leaves are designed to grow through the conservation of nutrient poor soil. Examples of plants in this biome are this is the blue oak, which grows in valleys, shrublands, and grasslands. It is adapted to drought and dry climates and can survive through any temperature. This is the common sagebrush. It grows in dry places where other plants do not. It likes well-drained soil and it is a greenish color. It has straight and stiff stems. It has adapted ways to save water. When it doesn't rain, its deep roots find water, but when it does rain, it has shallow roots to absorb the water. The king protea is found mainly in Cape Town. It is found in dry areas where soil has good draining. It takes moisture in through its leaves. The mountain mahogany is a shrub or small deciduous tree. It adapts with a system called dwarfing. Dwarfing is where the mountain mahogany gets smaller to survive. To find more answers about chaparral wildlife, I went to the New Haven Peabody Museum. As you can see here, there's a mule deer that um, live in the California chaparral, and uh, these make up the uh, primary consumers, which are then eaten by the higher protein levels. In order to survive in the volatile climate that is the chaparral, I enlisted the help of local biologist, Dr. Doug Schleiner. Hello, my name is Dr. Doug Schleiner, and this is my intern from Cornell. Hello, when I went to Chert, I studied under the tutelage of Margaret Blitzer, PhD. So we're here, here in California for the biome chaparral, and I'm here to talk about how fire is a necessary factor for this biome, because after all, it is a pyroclimax. Fire occurs approximately once every 30 to 130 years where crown fires occur. And a crown fire is when all the vegetation is destroyed, which is an example of secondary succession because at, when the fire comes through, it just kills everything. And then after it's gone, the vegetation comes back up. Fire, both natural and human caused, plays a huge role in shaping the ecology of the chaparral biome. As you can see from the chaparral in California, it appears to be very dry. So you can imagine during the summer, it makes the regions prone to fires, which are sometimes caused by, by occasional lightning strikes due to highly flammable foliage. Occasional fires in the chaparral biome, however, are necessary because they support living and non-living organisms. Here we have Camp Elliott Chaparral Reserve, located in San Diego, California. This is a picture before the Cedar Fire occurred, which burned a total of 800,000 acres. This is what the reserve looked after the fire, but many of the plants depend on fire for reproduction by recycling nutrients and removing dead vegetation. We can observe that there are still some plants that have still survived. These shrubs have four different survival strategies to respond to fire. Obligate resprouters, obligate cedars, fire followers, and facultative cedars. The scrub oak is an example of obligate resprouters, and these plants survive fires by resprouting only. Obligate cedars, such as Cyanothus, are adult plants that die in the fire, and the seeds then receive a fire cue and then germinate. Fire followers, such as whispering bells, are annual plants that require fire cues for germination to occur. Finally, there are the facultative cedars, which include the mature chamus and its seedling, which adult plants re-sprout and then a fire cue enhances seed germination. There are more major setbacks to chaparral fires because if there are more frequent fires, many plant species are eliminated and the chaparral is destroyed, typically being replaced by non-native weedy grassland. Whenever chaparral burns, everything goes, which is known as crown fires, that spread from crown to crown ahead of the ground fire. 